Hello, everyone. This is GM Josh Fidel. I'll be doing your uh, lecture for tonight. I'm the new GM in residence for the next few weeks. And let me mute my own YouTube stream. I am watching the comments. Uh, I'm going to be doing lots of kind of lecture type stuff, but I will be asking questions. So if you guys are uh, watching on YouTube and checking out the comments, I will be uh, doing that. Uh, in any case, uh, we're going to start with this game uh, between Sahis and Hebden. So this game, actually, uh, Sahis showed this game to me uh, in a trading session, I have to admit. So, But it really left kind of a cool impression on me because it was such a cool idea and the way the game concluded was really nice. Um, and it sort of does, uh, it really illustrates the topic of tonight, which is king power, uh, very, very well. So... Uh, this is Chessbase is what I'm using. So Chessbase is the software I use to, to do this. Uh, okay, so this position, white obviously has a dominating position, right? You have the queen on f5, bishop on d5 is a monster. The rook on f3 is really strong. But the question is, how do you actually convert this to a full point? And it's a lot more difficult than it looks. Uh, of course, you could play moves like, say, c4 and b5, but the problem is that the bishop's going to land on d4, and that's going to be kind of annoying. And the pawns aren't really going anywhere, right? So it, it's it's possible to play that way, but I don't think it's actually the cleanest. So the question is, what plan should white use here to try to win this game? And it's actually kind of interesting because the execution of the plan is a little bit tricky. But once you kind of see the plan, you sort of know what you have to do to try to win this game. <laughs> yes, king power is how we win. Well, if you uh, if you're to go by the title of the lecture, it'll really help you out a lot. So, so trade queens that get king up is a nice idea. So, tr but the problem with this is that your king takes a while to get to the center of the board. So by that time, it's possible black will have set up something kind of nice. And also, you need a clear way to trade queens, right? Uh, because at the moment, it's not so easy, actually, how you trade queens. Um, so, I mean, you have moves like bishop c6 you could try, but I, I don't know that it's actually that clear um, that you're going to be able to trade queens that easily, number one. And number two, that it'll actually be that easy to win uh, a position, even if you do trade the queens. So what other ideas could white possibly have in this position? And once again, guys, I am watching YouTube chat for some things. So if you guys uh, have some ideas, don't be afraid to shout them out. Uh, I usually don't yell at people for bad ideas. And bad ideas are kind of part of the deal. So it's not a, not so, so, so big. So we can push our pawns. As I said, pushing the C and B pawns is nice. But you're not really doing that much. You can push the pawn to G4. But again, it doesn't seem to accomplish too much. It's a weird position because black doesn't have that many moves. But it's also tough for white to improve their own position. Uh, yeah, goody men. So that's the right idea. You want to play with king f1. And king f1 is a perfectly good move here. Uh, in the game, he played king g2 first because he wanted to do something with tempi. And you'll kind of see what I mean with that. But quite honestly, both moves are perfectly fine and, and should do the job. So he starts with king g2, which is kind of an amusing move. So black doesn't really have much to do, right? They can't really move the queen anywhere because anywhere they move the queen, they're going to get hit with something. So the queen has to cover f6, right? If you try to go to c7, for instance, and I play queen f6 check, you're going to have a very, very long day. Uh, and by long day, I mean you're probably just going to resign in a move or two because you have to hold on to h6 and f7, and it's just impossible. If you try to play queen d8, oh, guarding the f6 square, I can take this pawn very safely. And even though I'm pinned up, queen g6 is a threat. That's also game over. Uh, the rook can't move because you simply take the pawn on f7 with queen, and that's going to be completely winning. So really, all and the king can't move either. If the king tries to move back, for example, you have the very evil queen g6 check, and that will also be all she wrote uh, with queen takes. And the idea is that the pawn is pinned, so you're not able to take the queen. So that being said, even though there are no real threats for white, the king can't really move. So the bishop is the only piece that can move, and it can only move to one square, really. It can go to b8 as well, but that's... 
very ugly and certainly not an improvement, right? Uh, so black tries to just play bishop b6, and now the king moves over. So once again, black just has no moves. They play bishop back, bishop back, king d3, bishop here. So we've achieved our goal of king to d3. Uh, if we ever trade queens or something like this, this is definitely a massive improvement. But the question is, how do we further our position from here? That's sort of the tricky part. Like, how do we improve our position from now that we have the king on d3? The question is, do we bring the king further or do we try something else? That's a nice idea, chess king, but where, how are you recruiting them, right? Like, what are you doing with them? That's possible, but think about this, right? You've put your king on d3. If you start playing moves like queen h3, rook f5, all of a sudden black's going to probably play, you know, queen c7, rook c8 at some point, uh, maybe after playing f6, and then... It's not going to be so easy, right? Because all of a sudden, so if, let's say queen h3, for example, right? I'm not exactly sure what move black would try here, but let's say, for instance, maybe queen c7, right? So if queen goes back to f5, I go back to e7, no big deal. If you try rook f5, maybe I even play f6. And the whole point is that now I'm ready to play rook c8, and you're kind of playing without your rook here, right? Maybe this is still, like, a playable option for you, like... I'm not saying this is terrible. Maybe forcing f6 is worthwhile. But it feels a little weird to move your queen and rook back like this. Playing for f4 is also very interesting. But it also takes a lot of moves. And keep in mind, your own king on d3 might become exposed if you try to do that. So white had another idea entirely. Bringing the king to a6 is actually quite interesting. And in fact, in this position, white did play king c4. So it looks a little bit crazy, but the idea is that you still want to bring the king over uh, to the queen side, right? And this is a reasonable way to do it. Um, so here, if black were to play bishop b6, you could kind of continue with the plan he did in the game. So we won't go over that just yet. But in the game, black played king, queen c7 check. So now where do you go with your king? Do you play the brave king b5 or the slightly more sensible rook king b3? Yeah, king b3 is a little bit more sensible. King b5 is possible. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it doesn't really achieve that much because I can always force you back if I want to. And the king there is a little bit a little bit hairy at the moment, right? Yeah, I mean, maybe you can get away with it, right? Um, and it might also be okay. But I would say that it's not really necessary, right? And, and so white simply just goes back to b3, yeah? Um, again, I don't think you get mated if you play king b5. As you pointed out, if rook check king here, you've actually done uh, white a favor because now the queen f6 and queen f7 are both kind of in the air. Uh, and if you try queen b6 check, king a4, 
I'm guessing the queen's also a bit misplaced. You have check. And the problem is you're threatening queen f6 check and you just kind of... I don't know, though. I would be nervous about this, right? Because now you have to calculate moves like, say, queen back to a1, trying to harass the king. If queen f6, king h7, bishop f7, you have to hope that you don't get mated or something. Probably this is good enough, you know? Maybe you have something, but I don't think it's necessary, right? Just play king b3. You, you don't want to go too crazy, especially when you have such a winning position. Because now black has to just go back, right? There's nothing to do. Otherwise, queen f6 check is coming. So they have to go to e7. And now this is kind of the crucial moment. Because here, white actually has a way to put black in a sort of zugzwang. And this is very, very nice. Bishop c6 is quite an interesting move. It's probably okay. The drawback of bishop c6 is that you don't, you kind of, you enable, so let's say you play bishop c6 here. The problem here is that you enable the rook and the queen to kind of move. Now, the queen maybe doesn't want to move because the pawn, the square of f6, but maybe the rook can move. So say something like rook b8 is maybe a possibility now. And again, maybe you can just play queen d7 and the end game is good enough. A position like this, you have many ways to actually win, right? But yes, this is white to play. Yeah, so remember, c4 is kind of going to give you the same issues that it had before. It allows the bishop to d4, and then maybe black can use the a file. I would be a little bit uh, careful with that. So in all these endgames, so bishop c6 is a great idea. It's actually similar to what was played in the game. But in all these endgames, you have to make sure your opponent's really locked down um, and that your pieces are optimally positioned. They're all in their best possible squares. So one of the ways you can do this is by finding a way to further improve your pieces and then only then trying to trade queens. So what he chose in the game was the move g4, and this is really sweet. Um, because at first it looks weird just putting your pawns on the same color as your bishop, but the fact is that you're now preventing any counterplay black could get in the endgame with the move g4 uh, himself. So if black were to try this in the endgame, maybe it'd be annoying. Now you're completely shutting it out, and you're making it so the black doesn't really have any moves. So of course they bring the bishop back to b6, and now the king comes up to c4. And the whole idea is that if queen c7 check now, you can play king b5, and notice how there's no key, there's no queen b6 check because this bishop is on a very unfortunate square on b6 now. So because of that, queen f6 check is a threat and black's actually just toast here. Like black can already resign. So in the game, black tried bishop a7. King to c6 is maybe a bit much. I mean, you're going to ask for queen e8 check and stuff like that. But the king is definitely on its way forward. And that's indeed what was played here. So king to b5 was played. And it's really a cool idea because think about it, like the only difference between this and the starting position apart from the pawn on g4 is the fact that the king's on b5 now. But the fact is that king on b5 is kind of scary and black now takes steps to try to parry it. So for example, if rook b8 check here, and I guess I'll ask you guys one more question. Do you get brave with a move like king a6 or do you try to retreat?
So your choices are king to a6 or trying to retreat with the, or trying to retreat with the king. You could also try king c6. Uh, I'm not going to lie. This is a move, but after rook b6 mate, you might rethink this. King a6. Yes. Yeah, and this move is actually winning because if you play rook b6 check, I simply play back with king a5, and you don't really have any great checks now, and queen takes f7 is on the horizon and probably going to uh, crush black next move. So black could try something like rook f8, but now you simply take on f7, and after all the, the trades, taking on f7, by the way, is not the only way to win. I should point this out. This is not the only way to do things. However, after a position like this, you can simply drop back to the bishop, and even though the f2 pawn is gone, look at this king on a6. It's a beauty, right? And you're just going to run this pawn up until you get a queen, basically. And this position should be quite easy to, uh, to win. So just as an example, right, uh, of how this can go wrong. So queen e8 check was tried in the game, which is definitely the best try. And then once again here, you have to find the right way to play. Because here, trying to come up with king a6, allowing queen check here, is not really something you want to do. This is an example of a king that's a bit too brave. So for example, now you can play rook b8 check, bishop b6 check, and you win the rook, but you end up getting checkmated. So trying to win this way, I would say, is not the best course of action. But white does have another really good move here. Well, I do like it. Yeah, I mean, and this is uh, kind of one of the ideas that one of you, that you guys have thought about already, which is this bishop c6 move. Because now you're ready to bring your queen to d7, where it's going to be really, really nice. Um, so here, there are all sorts of ideas. So if in the game, black played queen d8. If queen e7, you can play queen d7. So black tried this, which is maybe a better try. Uh, because here you're threatening queen b6 check, and queen b6 check is quite a powerful threat, right? Because with queen b6, you're going to take the bishop with check. So white retreats, and now black tries queen e7. If they play queen b6, you have a few options, but I think the cleanest is simply queen f6 check and taking the d6 pawn, and this should get the job done. The king is actually quite safe there, because if queen a6 check, you can simply play queen b3. Nothing really horrible is happening. Um, and this is actually just a completely winning position. Uh, there are so many possible threats here that I think black, black's going to struggle to, to make it a few more moves. Like moves like rook f6 are in the air. And this king is actually not so bad on c4. Uh, yeah, quite an example. So in the game, queen e7 was tried, but now white goes for the queen trade. And the whole idea is that once you trade queens, the fact that your king is so much better than your opponents plays a big role. So this king f1, e2, d3, c4, sure, you could have tried to trade queens first, but then black can also improve their own king. Here, you've improved your king kind of for free. Uh, and improving your king for free in an endgame is very powerful. So black tried the move queen e6, which is interesting. Queen takes d7 is maybe, I don't want to say objectively best because everything loses, right? But uh, it's, it's easy to see why black didn't want this, right? Because you do something like this, and here you can just play bishop back to c6 and king up to d5. And because your king is so powerful, you're threatening to take on d6, your pawns are coming up the board. I think that this position would be quite an easy win uh, for white. So in the game, he tried queen e6 check. And even though all the rooks get traded and you get to an opposite bishop endgame, because the white king is so powerful here, it was it's a fairly simple win. Uh, so he played king b5 in the game. You could even be very sadistic and careful and play the move f3. And basically say, ah, you got nothing. And after king e7, the key point is that in this position, you have a very, very important move, which also can come into play during the game. Uh, any guesses what that move might be? Now, don't get me wrong, I actually like the way he did it in the game better in some ways, because I feel like he uh, he was playing kind of, he was kind of pushing his advantages. But technically, this is also completely winning. 
So Chess King, it's actually very important which one you play. If you play the move C4 and I play King C7, it's not actually so easy now because Black's King on C7 is quite good. Uh, that that King is actually going to be quite an annoyance for you. Um, and make your life kind of difficult, right? Because it controls the B6 square. So King B7 is actually the killer move. And this is actually just completely winning. So even if Black grabs the C pawn, which is absolutely something they can do, there's not really anything they can do here because this king on, on b8, and you'll see the d8, you'll see this pattern in the game as well, is so completely shut out of the game that they're basically just waiting to waiting to get slaughtered here. Um, and you still have to be careful. For example, after a move like this, uh, you still have to be cautious, but I think you just move your bishop back, for example. And this pawn on b6 is just going to end up becoming a queen or becoming uh, way too strong. So sure, black can play a move like this, but even this kind of move is not going to really help too much. You can probably, maybe just bishop, even back to c6 is fine. Um, or even bishop to b3, right? Just be ready to take this pawn, and if they take, you take back. And again, it's just a position where they really can't do much. And because of that, you're, you're going to win this fairly simply because you're just going to be able to push your pawn up and your king's just going to be able to have free reign here. You're going to play king to c6 at some point and then just play b7 and mop up all the pawns. Uh, I don't know if this was actually the most precise way bishop b3 to do it. Uh, maybe king here is actually a bit nicer. I don't know. Because now you're threatening b7 and a take. Um, so maybe this is a bit better than what I played. You prevent king d7 ideas and all of this. The main problem is that black has just too many pawn weaknesses, and there's no way to guard all of them. So at some point, you're going to lose something. But again, you have many ways you can try to do it, but this would also win. King b5 was played in the game, so he basically just gambits this pawn. But this is also quite a clear way to do it, because now he plays c4, and then puts the king on b7. And this is a very, very clear uh, path to victory. So the idea is bishop e1, b5, bishop back, b6. So it's very similar to our previous example. He just has a c4 pawn instead of an f3 pawn. But it's actually very, very similar. So bishop d4. And now he simply clears the c6 square for his king. And here black has a lot of different options, but they all kind of lead to Zugzwang in some fashion. So for example, if bishop e3, king c6. Now if bishop c5, you play b7. And the whole point is that the bishop has to now cover the pawn, and you can just start munching. So you take this pawn, you'll take these pawns, you'll walk over and take h6. It's just too much. And if you play bishop c5, it's actually a cute position because you can play here, and black just has no good moves. The king can't really move away because of king c7. If the bishop moves uh, in either direction, you're going to have a problem. If it moves this way, you can actually play king a8, and now this pawn is just going to become a queen or win a bishop or something. And if you go this direction, now I go here, and now your d-pawn is hanging. Um, so it's a big problem. In the game, he played d5, and he was able to win pretty simply. He simply gets another pass pawn, moves his pawns up, guards against the e-pawn, checks, and plays king d7, and black resigned. Uh, probably in a position like this, the best try is a move like e2. Um, but after bishop takes e2, king b7... You have many ways to win. In my opinion, the simplest is doing this. Putting the pawn on d7, forcing this. And now black has no moves, right? They have to just basically do this all day. So you put the bishop on its beautiful f5 square. They come back. You play king f7. They have to come back. If they try to go this way, you play here, threatening queens. And then here. And that's unstoppable. So they must play bishop back to d8. And now you simply walk over and take the pawns. With a very, very easy win. So that was that game. Very, very nice example of how to play properly with your king in the endgame. Um, really, really sweet game. And, and definitely one I really enjoy. So moving on. And here was another game. Okay, so let's make sure we have everything correct. Okay, so I should change the... Uh, one moment.
Okay. So, now we have the game Salva Moser Friedel. So, I was playing black here. Uh, again, in a tournament in Germany in 2007. Uh, my opponent was Bernard uh, Salva Moser. And I was, this was an opponent, it was actually a really funny situation. It was, it ended up being one of the last games in the tournament and all. And this guy impressed me so much. Not just with how he played, but he impressed me with, like, the ferocity with which he played. Like, he wanted to win this game so badly. Um, and the way he played was just really, really sweet in this endgame from the white side. Um, so... You know, and he was rated 200 points below me. I was like a high rated IM at the time, and he was like, I think 2280. I was about 2480. So it was a pretty big gap between us. And he was the one who was pushing and trying for a win. And in general, I was just very impressed. And in my mind, when I think about King Power in an endgame, this is the game I think about from my own career. Um, and it was just a really, really interesting game as well. So let's get started. It's a pretty, it looks like it's a very simple position, first of all. And during the game, I did. I thought that, okay, knight on c4, connected past pawns. This should just be a draw, right? Like, there's no way the rook can defeat those pawns. If the king tries to run up, then my pawns start rolling. And in general, I was just not... I just thought we were going to shake hands and then the game would be over. I really thought that that's how this game would end. But it turns out I could not have been farther from the truth. Uh, and this game, again, went to be the last game done in the tournament hall that round, uh, I recall. So he played the move king a4. So fair enough. My plan here is basically just to sit. So I play king d8. And my plan is to basically sit and go between these two squares. King e8, king d8 till the end of time. And basically claim if you ever try to move your king up, for example, with king b5, now I play b3. And if king c6, I play b2. And now you're probably in huge trouble. Because my A-pawn is going to run up the board as well. And your king can't go to D6 because my beautiful C4 knight. So I could tell he really wanted to win. But I actually thought he was going to get into trouble by trying to win. Um, but instead, he actually played this in a remarkable way. So he played Rook H7 instead. Fair enough. So I play King E8. Of course, it's a mistake to play King C8. Because then you allow Rook E7 and he can capture my E-pawn. So King E8 is really the only try. But then here, he came up with a very clever idea in order to improve his king. This game is all about king power. And the king is the piece that's most impressive in this whole game. So what do you think white could try to activate their king here? And that's the thing, Chess King. I really thought that it would be just so difficult for White to activate their king. That's why I thought we were just going to shake hands around here. And I think against a lot of opponents, I would. Uh, what's funny is my judgment of the position was correct, but I underestimated severely how complicated this position is. So this is b5, by the way. Uh, not sure if you can see the coordinates, but I'm playing black here. So White could play king b5. But this move would again be a mistake, because I can simply push my pawn. And even though the king is becoming active, my pawn has become a one array fight train. And after, so for example, a move like rook b7, I simply keep pushing my a pawn. And white's only going to be able to lose this. They're not going to be able to win. So the problem with rook b7, chess king, is that king c6, king b5 is still not a possible move because of b3. So how can he actually be able to play king b5? He needs to be able to play king b5. You guys are right on the money about that. But how can he actually achieve his aim?
Very good, Chess King. That's exactly the correct idea. So you're correct, Brian, that it's Rook H3. Because now it looks like a weird passive move, but you're preventing the pawn from advancing by putting the Rook on H3, and now your King's ready to come up. So I played King D7. King F7 is possible here, but it doesn't really help me. Yes, my King's starting to come up, but if White simply slides the Rook over with a move like this, my King is now stuck on F7 and can't actually move. So this wouldn't actually help me. So I played to D7. But now king b5. So now he's coming up, right? So I play king c7. There's not much else for me to do here. He plays king c5. Very important move, by the way. Rook h7 check. And here, again, I'm kind of stuck because my pawns can't really move so easily and his king is ready to come up. If I try king c8 here, for example, he can simply bring his king to c6. And he's threatening mate, so this is problematic. So I played king to d8. So I totally missed that he could do this idea. He plays rook b7. So here it's clear to me that I missed this. But I still thought I should be okay. The knight on c4 is still gorgeous. He still has to worry about the b pawn. So I play king c8. My idea now is if he tries to play rook e7, b3, he's way too slow. This b pawn actually queens on him if he tries to take, right? I go here, pawn push. He can play this clever move, threatening mate. But the problem is, once I defend against the mate, he actually just resigns, because the b-pawn is way too strong. It's just going to make a new queen. Um, and if he tries to play rook b5, sorry, now king c7, and he's actually in Zugzwang. He has no moves here, which is quite an embarrassing situation, I must say. But yeah, this would be quite bad for him, of course. So he plays king c6, which is his only move. But it's a good one, because notice how neither of my pawns can move, because the rook's now behind them. Except now his king's on c6 instead of a4. So he's definitely making progress. And to say I was a little bit worried is an understatement. I was quite a bit worried here because I didn't see he could get this. But at the same time, I still wasn't panicking. I'm like, okay, his pieces are still... They're, they're decent, whatever. But he still can't actually penetrate, can he? The knight on c4 controls the d6 square. So he plays rook b8 check. King e7, rook b5. So we repeat moves a couple times, and he plays this. So, okay, I play king e8. He checks, comes back, we go here, and he plays rook b7. So I thought, it's now the time. He's finally going to let me draw. But the answer is no. He plays king c7 and rook b8. And here I'm thinking, wait a second, he can actually do this? <laughs> I forget if I offered a draw. I probably didn't because it was clear he was intent on winning. But I was like, wow, he's really going to try to do this. Okay. So he plays king c7. So I saw that this potential was, potentially was coming, but I thought that this would be way too risky from white's side. Because now there's no going back now. Like he had that draw, but now there's absolutely no going back. Um, because here I have an idea where I'm trying the one actually trying to push for a win now. Uh, once I try this idea. Now, keep in mind, like, White can still try to win, but what I'm saying is that it's not just an easy draw anymore once he plays this. It's a double-edged position. So it's kind of like point of no return. So what is my idea here to be able to get counterplay for the king and rook trying to box me out here? Yeah, it was it was far earlier in the game. I want to say it was the end game. I don't even remember the beginning part of the game, honestly. I mainly remember this end game. Yeah, exactly, Smortiza. So knight d2 is what I played, with the idea that after king c6 I play b3, and I'm gonna play a4 and a3. So this is what I mean by point of no return. He now does not have a simple draw. He has to. Be very, very careful that my pawns don't queen on him. But he calculated a while, and we didn't have unlimited time in this game. It was nearing the end. But he had a bit of time, and he calculated this out. So rook b7 check was played, and here I took a very long think. Because I realized that correctly, it was a very important decision. Uh, unfortunately for myself, of the three squares that I can go to, f8 e8 and d8 I actually chose the worst one <laughs> so
So despite the fact that I gave it all this time, I still didn't figure it out properly. But let's see if you guys can do better. Which of the three moves would be your choice? And keep in mind that it's not that there's necessarily a like clearly best answer. There's actually only a clearly worst answer. So the question is, what would you guys do? Yeah, fate says Brian. Okay. This is, by the way, a very difficult decision. So you guys probably can't figure it out in a few minutes. Again, I took, I'm sure I took like 10 minutes here. Because it was a very important decision. Um, so F8, you guys want F8. Dave wants F8, okay. So we have two F8s. Any other votes? Anything else? We have an E8. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you guys are correct that E8 and D8 are the best cards. I actually went to F8, which a couple of you wanted. Um... With the idea that I didn't want my king anywhere near the opposing king because I didn't want to have them threaten mate. But the fact is that gives my opponent uh, some very, very good opportunities that they wouldn't normally have. So if king e8, you can actually draw... Uh, so if king, rook b8 check, first of all, king f7, I'm actually winning because my king is escaping and my pawns are running. So he has to try king d6. And here the key is that I have this move b2. And I think I must have missed this. Which is very clever, because if king takes e6, of course, which is what he should do, threatening mate, I play b1 queen, preventing mate. Uh, and here we just actually trade to this endgame, and even though I'm up a piece, it's a very dead draw. Because his king simply runs over to, to deal with the pawn. So I don't know exactly what I would do here, but let's say, for example, I don't know, knight d2, king here. There's just no way for me to guard my pawn safely. I can't get my king knight behind the pawn... The two connecteds would make that probably drawish anyway. So probably I would just do something like this. And then come here and when we draw, right? Pretty easy draw. So king e8 would secure a draw because of that nice little tactic. But if you don't see the b2 tactic, that doesn't really ever work. King d8 is also very good. And I think what I missed here was after king d6, I can actually play king c8 and it's not so easy here. For the main reason that if rook b5, again, I have this b2 tactic, uh, which saves the day. And if rook c7 check king b8, he actually just loses because b2 is coming, probably. And if he has to play king c6, I can simply push my pawn because he's no longer making too many threats. Uh, I was a little worried to boot my king back in that corner. And I think that it was more of a kind of a, a visual decision than a calculated, well-calculated decision. But a position like this, the main lesson is you have to be calculating extremely well. And I wasn't really up to the task in this game. Uh, because I think if I calculated e8 or d8 thoroughly, I would have played there. But I play king f8. And again, during a game, there's more pressure. You don't know exactly what's at stake in your decision. It's a little bit more difficult. But at the same time, I think this is a good lesson. And when you just have to calculate uh, very precisely and not rely so much on intuition as far as where your king goes. Because intuition can definitely lie to you. So I played king f8, he played king d7, and this is the problem. I've given him the d7 square for his king, so he doesn't have to step on d6. And d6 is almost like a mind square because of this b2 idea, right? Because of the knight fork. So because of it, he doesn't have to step on the mind square, I actually have an issue now. And I think I just totally missed that king d7 was a thing. So if king f7, he simply plays king d6, and now it's with check. So he actually just wins because he just captures my pawn, and he's going to be too fast. So I play a4. What else can I do? King takes e6, a3. Again, my hand's kind of forced. I have to go for queening a pawn because I just don't have anything else. He plays king d7. And here I realize that, man, 
these tactics are not going to work out for me so well. <laughs> His king is just so strong. And then a2 and e6. And then this position is literally one of the most complicated positions probably that I've played. But um, certainly that I've played at least. You know, obviously there have been more complicated positions in history. I'm sure I've played some more. But especially considering the limited material, the complexity of this position is quite something. Uh, so in this position, and to give you an idea, this position is so complicated, even when you turn on Stockfish, it doesn't figure it out right away. <laughs> it takes a long time to actually figure it out. Maybe with someone with a better machine than I. But here's the question, actually. Do you play queens with a1 queen, or do you play b2 with the idea of queening next move? Uh, and that is kind of the question on the table here. And I remember also giving this question quite a bit of thought, uh, but it is quite a difficult one. So take your time, and what are the possibilities with b2 and with a1 queen? Which one would you guys prefer? So a complicated decision, so take your time. I would definitely not rush it because again, it's so complicated, right? Like that computers have trouble figuring it out is telling enough. But I would say that at the very least, you you can figure out which move is better. And that's kind of the more important. You don't have to figure out which move ends in a draw or which move doesn't or whatever else, because that's really difficult. But you can at least figure out which move is better. And that's kind of the key. That's kind of what I thought, Subankar, actually. But it turns out, yeah, 94 is the other possibility, but 94 will make you very sad, and I'll show you why in a moment. So I guess let's get out of that out of the way. If 94, which looks very clever at first, because after e7, king g7, it looks like you're going to play knight f6 and actually just win the game. The problem is, after queens... Knight f6 check, white plays king e6, and unfortunately that is also a check. So knight f6 actually just loses, because this wins immediately. So knight e4 looks very clever, but in fact it actually just loses. So yeah, chess king, you actually hit one of the main lines. So the best move here is definitely b2. Um... I could play king g7, by the way, and this transposes, because after e7, I have to play b2 anyway. So it doesn't really matter uh, which one you play first, I don't believe. But it's the same thing. You play b2. So here, if rook takes b2, you simply get a queen. And this position is going to be quite decent for black, because after here, your rook's attacked, right? So you have to queen, and then I take the rook. And okay, white can take the d-pawn and draw, but they're not going to win this position. So e7 check is best. Queen. And then black queens. So here we've reached the start. And as Chess King points out, 
they absolutely found the best idea. If you try to play king c6 check, now I simply take the rook and queen. And once again, I'm very happy, even though it's a draw. So rook c7 is the really testing move. And this position is the one that's immensely complicated. Uh, because, because white's moving the king with check, it's just so frightening. So you have to find the correct move here. And I have to say that I think that I don't even think I saw this during the game. I, I mean, we neither of us had tons of time at this point, and I definitely didn't see all of this. Um, but I definitely was very worried about queening a move later, even though it, the key is that the queen hit the rook on b7, right? That was the key. So because of that, I didn't lose a tempo by queening the b pawn. Because remember, the b pawn's one move slower than queening the a pawn. But the key is that the queen on b1 and pawn on a2 give me more options here. Because the queen on a1 is actually more out of play than the queen on b1. The question is, though, what do I actually play here, right? Because it's not actually that simple. Also, since we're talking king power, look at this king on d7. What a monster that guy is, right? <laughs> look what it did to me this game. I was basically traumatized only by this king. The problem is, though, Rahul, that how do you actually do it? Because remember, the king's going to move with check. So if you play queen b5 thinking you're going to trade queens, think again. Because you're actually just going to get mated or lose your queen at the very least, right? So that would not be very good. So king f6, I think you get mated with king f6. So something like rook c6 check, I want to say. Or no, sorry, queen e5 check is very strong because it pings your king down, right? So now if you play king f7, I move my king with check. And if you go here, I play check. And now you're going to get mated for sure. You're just not going to have enough, right? Yeah, so guys, just to point this out because I saw this a few times. Queen b5 check is met with king e6 check, remember? And here you actually just lose. So you have to be very, very careful. You can't just check the king for no reason, right? Like the, the king moves with check, not for no reason, of course. Um, so king f6 doesn't work because of queen e5 check. You could try king h6, I think was a better try. Uh, but here I can play rook e6 check, I believe. And then after here, queen e3 check. And this is mate. It's not mate immediately. But it's made after several moves because the problem is I can't stop the rook from getting into the attack. And once the queen and rook work together, my king's just too naked. It's just, it has no help of defense. So the line would go something like this, check. So the idea is that if knight f3, I can play queen g2 and win the knight this way and, or be able to check with the rook at the very least. Like everything's with check. So king f5, queen check. King e4, queen check. And the key is that now... My rook gets in the game, and he can't stop it. So once this happens, and again, there are many, many variations, but the basic gist is that once, and again, this seems unnecessary, right? And then here, there's one final blow you guys can find. But once the rook gets into the game, even with my monster knight on d2, there is a way to win the game. Yeah. And again, guys, don't worry about suggesting moves that may not be may not work. If you miss something, I mean, we all miss things, right? So, but suggesting is kind of how you learn about it. Um, so, I'm never gonna judge you too harshly for your move. I mean, that's actually not completely true. <laughs> Just kidding. But uh, you know, it, it's not really about whether your move is good or not. It's like a kind of getting things out there and learning things. But yeah, you got it. Rook c1 check is very strong. So the idea is you have to take it legally, and then queen check, and I take your queen. And this should be winning. So king h6 doesn't work. Making a queen in this position, trying to get two queens is too greedy. This doesn't work either. I play, for example, king d8 check. And then the key is, once again, this queen check. And I just have to make sure your queens can't block, right? And once I get my rook into the game like this, I'm able to take. And here, because the king is just totally naked and the queens are not helping enough, uh, white will be able to give checkmate here. So again, I mean, like, th the reason I'm not showing all the lines is simply because there's too many. Um, so if in these lines you're thinking, oh, what about this, what about this? Trust me, it's all there. 
But um, this is most certainly the very best. So instead, though, I played queen, thinking that, well, queening a move sooner has to at least be okay. But the fact is that actually queening a tempo later, which normally would be horrible, right? You're getting a queen a move later. Think about how extreme that is. Because you hit the rook is actually good. But this position, I realized as soon as I got here, I was in big trouble. Because checking the king, the king moves with check. So the best move I, I found was simply taking this pawn. Um, and this move loses by force, but at the same time, there's not much else to do. I could try it queen a6, but at the very least, white can just take this pawn, and this is just dead. Um, I have no checks, and the queen's very strong, and it's just losing. So I tried taking, and here my opponent played king e6 check, but believe it or not, he has an even more crushing way to win. Uh, and it's really beautiful just because of the concept of how this move works. So king e6 check is what he played, which is good enough to win uh, with best play. But he actually has uh, a very, very clean way to do this, which is really, really neat. So try to find it. It's a little bit tricky, but it's, uh, it's actually a really sweet way to win. So, uh, John, the, the pawns are... I'm black here, right? So the pawns are moving up the board, not the other way. And yes, it's very easy to lose track of where the pawns are going in a position like this. It's very uh, easy to do, so don't worry about it too much. But yeah, the pawns are going up the board, um, right? This is b3, this is d5. But yeah, don't worry about it. That, that happens to everyone. That, that's a very common thing. Yeah, queen e7 check may win also. I'm not sure. Uh, it's very likely. Uh, but it's kind of a similar thing. Like the king, my, my king's going to try to move up the board. Yeah, like this, this is probably good enough to win. Something like queen e7 check is probably similar to what he did, honestly. Where my king moves up the board, right? So check. And probably I just try to, try to run, right? Uh, the advantage, though, is that if my king ever gets here, which is very funny because eventually in the game, this is kind of what happened. He has to be careful. Probably here it's still winning, I would guess. But again, he has many ways to win here. The coolest, though, which is very tricky, is actually playing queen h5. Queen e6 is a very good guess, uh, by the way. Uh, but not quite as strong as this move. And this move is just all kinds of nasty because... He's threatening king e6 check, right? But I have, like, no way to stop this move. If I try to play king f6, he simply skewers me with queen h8 check and wins the queen. Probably he has other wins too, but that's the simplest. And otherwise, I just can't stop this check because I can't even attack his rook. That's the key. This rook can't be attacked on b7. So if I could attack that rook, I'd have a better shot, but I can't even do that. So I basically just have to wait for king e6 check. And if queen f6, 
he can play king e8 check and now i just lose because after king here this is me so a real brutal finish to the game would have been queen h5 that's a really sweet move and honestly he would have deserved it like he deserved to win this game i definitely did not but moving to that he played king e6 check which is still good enough i should point this out i play king h6 because i have to run right there's no other choice but running and he plays the move queen f6 f8 check which is good and here i thought i was going to resign in a few moves quite honestly but luckily he was very low on time probably we were both low but he was quite a bit lower so if i play king g5 he simply plays rook g7 check and forces me to sack my queen so i play king h5 but the question is how does white win here because this was the moment where he actually threw away the win um it was with this move and again i was expecting to just shake his hand in a couple moves and be like too good man i would have been a little upset right but it's like he outplayed me what am i gonna do I don't know everyone has their own games that make them upset right in this case though it was like just getting outplayed obviously you can hope to play better but so guys it's very important to play moves with tempo right because he can't just get away with playing rook g7 and saying, well, you can't stop queen h8. Because here I can play queen b6 check, there's queen e4 check. I'm going to start checking him a bunch, and that's not going to be that clear. Because it's really hard to get out of checks in an open board like this. The reason why I, he, I couldn't get out of checks before, or rather he couldn't get out of checks before, or could, sorry, is that he could move his king with check, right? Here he can't. So the better version is rook h7 check. Because now, he, I have to play something like king g4. If I try king g6, I actually get mated in one with this move. That is checkmate. So king g4, and now he simply slides over. So the queen's going to slide to h8 with mate, right? If the king tries to move back, this is going to be mate. And if I try to go up the board, like say this, he has many ways to win again. But queen f5 checks the simplest, and he's going to give mate in a couple moves. Because my king's going to be stuck on the edge of the board. Um... And he can play, for example, queen h7 check next, and it's going to be over. Um, and after I sack my queen, he simply can play here and take the pawn, and his queen's too good, and I would just be losing. Um, so in the game, however, he played queen f5 check, which looks at first like it's plenty good enough. But again, he was short on time, he wasn't sure. And the problem here, and I think this is what he missed, is that in this position... If he tries to check my king up the board like this, I simply play king here. And he actually has no more checks that are good. So he actually has to be careful here. So you'd think he'd be winning here, right, chess king? But he actually is not winning at all. So here he played queen h3 check because he wasn't sure what else. He was, again, playing on seconds. King f2. I think I was as well at this point. Rook f7 check. King e2. So end of the game. Check. King here. And then this was the crucial moment. Because here, obviously, things have gone horribly, horribly astray. But he's not lost yet. He still has a chance to save the game. After queen takes d5, it's just a draw. I could try to push my pawn, but he simply goes here and sacks with the rook, right? Because if we trade queens, I play b1, he simply takes it with his rook, and it's just knight against king, right? But instead, he again panicked a little bit. And this is where keeping your calm under pressure really helps. Uh, he played the move queen f5 check, and here I think he just blundered. I, I think he was still trying to win, which is probably just unwise at this point. Um, but sometimes you kind of lose sight of your goal when you're just playing off of seconds, right? And it's really important to kind of keep calm. And here, this move actually loses. Um, I'm sure you guys can figure out what what move is very good against queen f5 check. Very good. Queen e4. And it's a check. So he doesn't have time to take on d5 or do anything else. Again, it was last minute. He grabbed the queen. I took with the pawn and he just... I think he lost on time, but he's lost here. Because b2 is coming and e pawn is coming. And he just can't 
hold his own against all these pawns. So, for example, if rook b7, I could play just e3 and the game is going to be over uh, very, very soon. So, in this position, he, he... I forget whether he resigned. I think he lost on time, but he, it's a resignable position in any case. So, kind of a crazy end to the whole game, uh, to be perfectly honest. Like, not... Not exactly the way I expected it. And again, he really outplayed me almost all of this endgame. Like, he played very impressively. The earlier part of the game, I remember, was kind of weird. And probably I should have done better than I did. But in, the end, in this endgame, he played so impressively. And it was only because of time and because he maybe pushed too hard at the end that the win turned into a draw, then turned into a loss. Uh, but this is kind of what happened. But I do want you to notice one thing. In the end, who's the hero of this position? It's the Black King on T3. So, and the only reason why this was possible is because my king went on a walkabout. So, the king can be such an important piece in all of these endgames. Um, and it's not something to be underestimated. So, think about always, can I improve my king, whether it's making it safer or whether it's going on a bit of a walk, braving some danger, but the rewards, as you can see, can be quite great. In any case, I hope you... I hope you uh, enjoyed these examples, and I will be back on Thursday for the GM choice and for uh, games of the week. So I hope you enjoy that, and I will see you then.